Sherlock. Now then, while well, I could certainly do with a spot of tea. Kaduk. Bars pretty much only have booze, so I don't see that happening right now. Vlad the Third. Though I do enjoy a good glass of red wine, I don't think I could do so in this rundown tavern. I'm afraid my drink will have to wait until another time. Holmes. All right, you two. Tell us everything you saw. Even the smallest detail could be of great importance. Hmm. Da Vinci, I see. Armies comprise entirely of servants, huh? Vlad the Third. I have dreamt of such fantastic sights before, but I never thought I would actually see such a thing for myself. Da Vinci. Even our database says that seven against seven is as many servants as have ever fought it, each other at once. We've seen edge cases where multiple servants were involved, like the final singularity, but that's exceedingly rare. Holmes. Indeed, even putting aside the importance of that battle as the crossroads for humanity's survival, it was nothing less than a miracle. But there's never been anything else close to that large-scale servant versus servant warfare we just witnessed. Fascinating. Truly fascinating. Kadok. Only got a quick look, but I saw that they had longbow archers from around the Hundred Years War. There were also some samurai looking warriors going from their armor. I'd guess they were generals from Japan's Warring States period. Some of the archers used matlocks and other servants looked like cowboys straight out of the Old West. I couldn't get a good look at the caster though. They either had their faces covered or were using some kind of perception blocking. Holmes. So these armies consisted of all seven classes from a wider range of cultures and regions. Hmm. Kadok. Probably. Aside from that, I also heard them say something about heroic spirit levels and phantom spirit levels. Holmes. They must be referring to their spirit origin ranks. With more than 200 servants in total, it's understandable that not all of them would be heroes of great renown. Given what you've told us, Kadok. It would seem that these servants are not heroes who took part in famous battles. But little known humans who would normally never be summoned as servants. Da Vinci. Maybe so, but they're still servants. Holmes, I see. Uh, Master. Why did you go out of your way to confirm that, Holmes? Holmes. Ah, that, because there is a great difference between a demonic beast as strong as a servant and an actual servant. It's far from pithy, but it's more accurate to define a servant as a heroic spirit with a master. Though, of course, that definition can be applied quite broadly. For example, under this definition, we could say that the land itself serves as a rogue servant's temporary master. But I digress. My point is, no matter how weak or strong a heroic spirit may be, as a rule, they cannot exist as a servant without a master. Master. Then what's the story with those servants? Ah, uh, that is a question, no? Who could their master be? Or does there exist some manner of exception to the rule, which is permitting them to exist without a master? Kadak, so it's still too early to say, huh? Holmes, I'm afraid so. I still need to dig a bit deeper. Master, we also heard them say revenge, reinstatement, and righteous. Holmes, indeed, that all sounds very important as well. Perhaps just as important as how those servants came to exist. The revenge realm, the reinstatement realm, and the righteous realm. These names no doubt reflect each faction's particular bent, and there are other things we can presume based on the different names you heard. Krimild of the Revenge Realm. I believe we can confidently say that she is the Krimild of the legends about Siegfried. She is most likely a Saber or a Berserker, though we cannot rule out Avenger. 
The fact that she has formed an army of heroic spirits means that she is either highly intelligent herself or has an intelligent second in command. Constantinos of the Reinstatement Realm. There have been rather a few men named Constantinos in recorded history, but I suspect we are dealing with the 11th. Constantinos XI is said to be the last emperor of the Byzantine Empire. I must say, I find the choice of reinstatement for his faction's name intriguing, but we can leave that for another time. And finally, Charles the Great of the Righteous Realm. Now that is quite a name indeed. If we truly are talking about THE Charles the Great, then I would say his victory in this war is a foregone conclusion. Vlad III, I am inclined to agree. Neither Krimhild nor Constantinos can even begin to compare to him. Master, is Charles the Great really that, uh, great? Kadok, did they not teach you anything in school? Anything at all? Charles the Great is all over European history. He's got to be one of the most famous people in the world. He was the King of the Franks and the first Holy Roman Emperor to inherit the mantle of ancient Rome. He's even known to many as the Father of Europe. You do know how a servant's strength depends on part of how famous and mystical their heroic spirit is, right? Well that pretty much put Charles the Great up in the highest tier of servant. Holmes. However, some things don't quite add up for me. For example, the Righteous Realm's manner of fighting. Vlad III, what do you mean? Holmes, you told us that the Righteous Realm stood back and let the other two sides exhaust each other before swooping in. And that they then chose to leave the battle shortly afterwards so as to not exhaust their own soldiers. What do you make of their tactics, Count Vlad? Vlad, inarguably effective, however. Da Vinci, go on. Vlad, there was a clash between two medium-sized forces and a fairly one-sided one at that. Had the Righteous Realm's army chosen their timing more carefully, they could have decimated both other armies. If I had been leading their charge, I would have waited until the other sides were a bit more entrenched. You said that the Reinstatement Realm's armies was hitting the Revenge R Realm with full force to deny them an opportunity to surround them in a pincer movement. In which case, the Righteous Realm's fortress should have easily been able to obliterate the exhausted Reinstatement Realms. Even if the Reinstatement faction had chosen to ignore the Revenge Realm in a favor of fighting back against the Righteous, they were too far into enemy territory to mount a successful defense. By that point, the Righteous Realm's archers and casters could inflict significant damage on the reinstatement forces without even bothering to aim. So from everything you told us, it would seem the Righteous uh, Forces' timings was slapdash at best. Holmes. What if that timing was a deliberate choice? Vladther. Is that what you think? Holmes. I don't know, but if we assume that it was, I can think of several possible explanations. That said, I can't speak with certainty on any of them at this point. Kodak, ah, uh, yeah, okay, I see where this is going. Master, now is not the time. Holmes, <laughs> it seems I've been beaten to the punch. Now then, as for their objective, Rogue servants summoned by the Holy Grail powering a given singularity have generally worked in service of humanity. That, at least, has been what we have seen thus far. Most of the heroic spirits summoned in rituals such as the Holy Grail have been on humanity's side as well. But of course, heroic spirits come in all shapes and sizes, in multiple senses of the word. In addition, when they have a master, their master's personality affects their own. Both the ineffable nobility of heroes and the naked cruelty of monsters reflect that person's true nature and are recorded as such. Kodak, is there like a point to you just repeatedly telling us all shit we already know, Holmes? 
this is going somewhere, right? Holmes. Haha, <laughs> my apologies. What I mean to say is, the present state of affairs would normally be unthinkable. Hundreds of servants forming armies and acting in concert, regardless of whether they are good or evil? What's more, they seem to have a set aside any regional, national, cultural, ideological differences to do so. Vlad. In one sense, that sounds like a perfect world. But the fact that their unity is in service of a war between their three kingdoms, or perhaps realms is a better word, is anything but cause for celebration. Kodak. Where does that leave us? Are these guys our allies, or should we be treating them as enemies? Maybe we can form a temporary alliance, like you guys did with me. Holmes. I certainly hope at least one of these realms is on our side. We must be exceedingly cautious in our approach, though. Never before have we faced anything like an organized army of servants. Vlad. There is only so much Holmes and I can accomplish on our own. The force we saw earlier would almost certainly have been destroyed in battle against any one of the realms. Da Vinci. No matter how you slice it, the sheer numbers are too much, and on top of that, they also have their noble phantasms. Vlad. Mm. Prepare yourself, master. We have enemies here. What? Kodak, huh? Enemies? Assassin class. I'll be taking that head now. Vlad, I'm afraid not. Assassin. Gah! Vlad, assassins. Mash. Eh, enemy servants detected. I'm so sorry, I didn't notice this sooner, master. Holmes. Damn, they're using presence concealment. No wonder they got the jump on us. Kodak. How did Vlad notice them then? Oh right, he must be sensitive to the smell of blood. Vlad. Worry not, we can take them. Are you ready, Master? Master. Ready! Kodak. Yeah, I'm just gonna stand over here. No reason for me to get in all that. Holmes. By all means. Vlad, I assume you're here to track down stragglers? I don't expect you'll answer, but I may as well ask, what realm are you from? Assassins. Mm. Vlad, as I thought, well, it matters not. The fact remains, you are my enemy. So I will show you no mercy. Come, let me show you how sharp my mournful stakes truly are. <laughs> 